All right, so uh, today is, uh, like most of our workshops, we are going to present the concept, look a little bit of the research, walk through each con concept, but also give you case studies from right here at William & Mary. Uh, so I would like you to think about universal, the, the term universal, uh, universal design, about access and promoting access. And so if you have a product or an item or something you want your students to learn about, a concept, you want to give them access to that learning as universally as possible. Because one thing we know about students, one thing we accept about teaching and learning is that students are variable. Student variability is the rule and not the exception. So if we accept that, why would we use the same instructional techniques uh, all the time for all of our students? There's not a lot of good reasoning for that. So if you want to promote access, you offer multiple ways to get to that learning. This is a concept we've seen in society a lot. Probably the most recognizable is universal design in architecture. So here's the tale of two buildings. Anybody recognize this one? It's not there anymore for good reason, right? This is Millington. And Millington was built before universal design as an architectural principle was widely used. So what did they have to do to this building to make it accessible by as many people as possible? Anybody catch it? Yeah, they put a big ugly ramp right in front of it. So they didn't build the ramp into the design of the building. They had to add on, they had to modify. And for your instruction, we encourage you to think about it in the same way. Instead of having existing instruction that you try to modify to make it more accessible to people of all backgrounds and variations, why not design it with access in mind? There are ways to do that. We have the research and the science and the practice and the case studies to help you do that. So instead of adding on a ramp, you build in a way that is accessible to start with. So this is the commons. There's ramps already built into the buildings on the side. There's big wide doorways. There are buttons to push that opens the doors for you. There are easy to operate door handles. And the great thing about this approach is that those modifications on that building are not just useful for the folks who might happen to be in a wheelchair or use a cane or have a disability. They're useful for everyone. I use the ramp if I'm pushing a cart or if I just want to use the ramp. I push the button if I have my arms full to get in the door. So the idea of universal design is not catering to an individual need. It's, uh, it's casting a wide net and trying to design in ways that all people can benefit. And we find that to be true in teaching and learning, and especially with the e-learning tools and resources we have. And so that's our goal today, is try to uh, take this idea of universal design, look at the principles as they stand, and then give you some supporting technologies that will help you do this. And most importantly, to give you some tips that you can go today and work on. Because universal design can be a little bit theoretical and kind of hard to get started. So we want you to walk out of here with tips to start. So that's what your handout is for. Uh, you'll notice you have three columns, key ideas and practical uh, applications, potential ap applications are for you. And then those action steps. When we get to that point in the presentation, we encourage you to write some of those down. Now, if you flip that page towards you, on the back, you'll see universal design for learning the actual standards and steps. Don't get overwhelmed. There's a lot there. Uh, we'll show you how to use that. This is taken right from their website, and that website is on your additional resources uh, on the other side there. And everything is clickable on the website, so if you find something that interests you, you can easily click on it and see the examples and use cases. Uh, and you also notice it's color-coded. So everything that we do with Universal Design for Learning today will follow those color codes. So if it's about engagement, it'll be green. If it's about representation, it'll be purple. And if it's about action and expression, it'll be blue. All right, so let's get our definition, our operational definition going. This is from their website. Universal Design for Learning, UDL, is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. I want you to know, especially you natural scientists out there, you positivist folks, that this is based on learning science, cognitive science, uh, and neuroscience. We're not going to get into the depths of the science today because I'll probably screw it up. All right, but we are going to get into the application. So this is built on something solid. So this is a helpful definition, but I think more helpful is to hear uh, from some folks who study this in depth. So we'll watch a quick uh, vignette, then we'll grab our lunch. 
Uh, this is, I think, two years ago, Mike, we did this. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, we had a seminar where about 10 faculty members came together and did a semester's long work uh, to do a deep dive into UDL and to understand it better and to apply it. And so we asked two faculty contributors to facilitate those sessions, and they made a video describing how they see the use of UDL here at William & Mary. So we thought it'd be helpful to go back and let you see that. UDL, I think, is a way to think about teaching and learning from the planning stage and trying to think about all of the variability that exists. You know, all of our students are individuals, even though they share some characteristics. They certainly have their own individual sort of preferences, challenges, hopes and fears, and all those kinds of things that they bring with them to the classroom. So I like UDL as a way to systematically think about and plan for that variation in the classroom. I like the, the idea of thinking strategically about what I, how I'm presenting content, what I'm asking students to do, how I'm asking them to uh, share what it is they understand, what it is they know, in ways that remove some barriers that might get in the way of them accessing the content or expressing their understanding. So I like it as a way to be strategic and systematic about how I plan for teaching and, and what I ask my students to do. I think When I think of universal design and learning, I think of ways that we can go about identifying our goals for students and come up with more than one way to evaluate whether or not they've reached those goals. You know, some students really prefer a textbook and they really like that structure that comes with that. Other students like a more of a mix of different types of materials. So typically when I assign a reading, uh, there's the textbook reading, the more traditional approach, but I try to find other materials, whether they're uh, good substantive blog posts, instructional uh, kinds of videos, different types of resources, even sometimes simulations or interactives that cover the same content, but maybe in a different way. So oftentimes I'll make a suite of possibilities available to them from which they can choose. Uh, sometimes if there's a specific reading, I want to make sure that everyone reads then I require that piece, but then I provide options for, you know, enhancement kinds of readings. So. Literature doesn't necessarily have to be evaluated as a standard research paper. It could be a very different kind of public presentation. You know, research should be public anyway. And uh, so that I'm, I'm really thinking that I might be able to offer students an alternative way of demonstrating mastery of content and mastery of research rather than the traditional research paper. Just like there is multiple ways for architecture to promote access to a building and its benefits, there are multiple ways for teaching and learning design to offer access uh, to students uh, who are learning. And those ways are categorized in Universal Design for Learning in three basic tenets or three categories. And they are or multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. And we'll unpack these a bit, but in general, the first one, the green one, engagement, is how students interact with the material and the content. How do they process it? How do they crit critically think? How do they um, digest and dissect? Multiple means of representation has to do with how that content is available to them both in mode, modality, formats, how they can get at the material. And finally, action and expression has to do generally with how students demonstrate their learning. How do they show their achievement? What evidence is provided and what options are there? So those are the three basic tenets and the little brains are there because again, this is built on neuroscience. The idea is that different networks of the brain handle these different aspects of learning. All right, so engagement, representation, and expression, green, purple, blue, and follow along as we head into this. 